race to become France's new president is down to two. Marine Le Pen and Emmanuel Macron sont qualifiés pour le second tour. This election is about more than just liberal versus conservative. Can this former banker rule that part of France that feels... Macron, 39 ans, est déjà président. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post. Here are some of the stories we're covering this week. The far-right Marine Le Pen is within striking distance of the French presidency. Did the media in France help get her this far? And how do they cover her now? A new constitution, but the same old problems for journalists in Turkey. At least nine arrests since the referendum vote. The left-wing party Podemos may be popular in Spain, but it's no thanks to the news media there. And fact-checking the post-fact president blowing the lid off the lies. France is heading into the home stretch of its presidential election campaign, down to two candidates, with the second round coming up May 7th. This is the first time since 2002 that the French news media have had a candidate from the far-right Front National to cover in the runoff, Marine Le Pen. Back in 2002, her father, Jean-Marie, was the candidate. But the prospect of an Elysee palace occupied by the far-right figure led the French establishment, including the media, to close ranks. That Le Pen was crushed at the polls. A lot has changed since then in politics and media, and this Le Pen's hoping that the French establishment, again, media included, is no longer the force it once was. She's running as an anti-establishment candidate, but then that's what her opponent, Emmanuel Macron, calls himself too. Now, Macron's not fooling anyone in the media with that line. He is, after all, a former cabinet minister and an ex-investment banker. And the proof of that lies in the fact that the French media are clearly siding with him. For a skilled media practitioner, though, like Marine Le Pen, that could work in her favor. Our starting point this week is Paris. It's one of those French terms that's made its way into English, un fait accompli, something that's happened before those affected are properly consulted and cannot be changed, what Americans call a done deal. Judging from the front pages immediately after round one, that's how the French papers see this election. Emmanuel Macron is destined to win, a prophecy the media themselves can help fulfill with what looks like unbridled support for Macron over Marine Le Pen. There's no doubt about that, and they will spend the next two weeks, presumably, uh, campaigning on his behalf, uh, or at the very least, attempting to convince those members of the electorate who have hesitations that the most important thing now is to vote for him, holding your nose if you want, um, but to vote for him to block Marine Le Pen. For example, hier, le... for instance, you had the chief political analyst of the national news channel France 2 going on the air and saying... C'est lui, ça lui aura pris un an, un an pour arriver et être le huitième président de la cinquième république. Well, he hasn't been elected yet. There are still two weeks before the election. But for them, it is so natural that Macron will be elected, that some incredible things will come up. Des trucs incroyables. Nous sommes un petit peu tout seuls Contre les autres. So, it's us against them. Many politicians do not side with Monsieur Macron, but they are against Madame Le Pen. And for the most part, that goes for journalists too, who you can see are against us, against the Front National, because very often they work for media owned by the supporters of Monsieur Macron. Soutien Monsieur Macron. From the outset of his campaign and the formation of his new party, En Marche, Emmanuel Macron has positioned himself as a political outsider, anti-establishment, as if a career path through an investment bank and a cabinet position could produce such a candidate. The real outsider is Marine Le Pen, and the evidence of that is the backing, virtually across the board, that Macron is getting from the fourth estate, either from the journalists providing the content or the media owners writing the checks. Ensuite, il y a un autre groupe qui est le groupe LVMH. The LVMH group is a luxury group that belongs to Bernard Arnault. They own Les Parisiens and Les Echos, which treated Macron very well. The Figaro, which is a right-wing newspaper, belongs to Dassault. Dassault is an industrialist who builds warplanes. Then, there is a left-centrist group which owns Le Monde, Le Nouvel Obs, Les Aftem Post, Telerama. This group belongs to three billionaires, including Xavier Niel, who made his fortune in telecommunication. And all these media outlets were in favor of Macron. 
ont vraiment soutenu Macron. Emmanuel Macron, c'est vrai qu'il a été appelé un peu le, le chouchou des médias. Emmanuel Macron est kind of a media darling. One of his main financial supporters is Pierre Berger, a shareholder of Le Monde, which is one of the biggest French daily newspapers. When you have Pierre Berger on your side, you know that many media gates will be open for you. Les portes ouvertes partout dans les médias. Nous combattons cela. This is what we are fighting. But many journalists think that they have to be politically correct and always please the powerful, please their employers, but also please the politicians that they think will become powerful tomorrow. Puissant demain. Europe is seeing a wave of populist anti-immigration parties ascending in the polls. But unlike Germany, Austria, Italy, and others, this phenomenon is not new to France. The media there have covered the Front National since its birth in 1972. The party's founding leader, Jean-Marie Le Pen, initially called for the systematic repatriation of all immigrants, documented or not. He dismissed the World War II Holocaust and the deaths of six million Jews as a detail of history, and did so more than once. He compiled multiple convictions for xenophobia and inciting racial hatred. When she succeeded her father in 2011, Marine Le Pen set out to, as she put it, de-demonize the party. Her tone is much more moderate than his, and on the occasions when she does sound like her predecessor, she doesn't talk about Jews, she focuses on Muslims. Je ne veux pas que mes filles soient cachées sous des burqas. Je ne veux pas qu'on m'impose de manger du halal. Fifteen years ago, the only time Jean-Marie Le Pen made it to the second round of the presidential elections, the media coalesced around Jacques Chirac and against the Front National. In that respect, history is repeating itself. But in the age of social media, with anti-establishment forces on the rise and mainstream news outlets in decline, how will the French media's pro-Macron message be received? All the traditional media hysterically supported Chirac over those two weeks. There was a unanimity that was astonishing. We all experienced an incredible surprise and there was a real fear. It was unimaginable to see him in the second round. So it was a terrifying moment that unified the media. We all felt that the world was collapsing, but this time around, journalists were not very surprised with the first round results. They played Marine Le Pen's game and followed her media agenda. So in a way, the media have helped her rise by spreading her word. And today, Marine Le Pen could become the next French president. Moi, j ai, j ai bien connu, uh... I remember 2002 very well, when Jean-Marie Le Pen went through to the second round, and it was a very hard time. The atmosphere was unbearable. This time, the atmosphere has changed, and Marine Le Pen is treated better, but it's still biased, and Monsieur Macron is favoured as he has been for a long time in the media. The other dynamic that has changed uh, is regarding the media. Um, since 2002, popular criticism of the media as a locus of power has grown, which is to say that in 2017, that the average citizen will say, well, the media have made their choice, but their interests are not our interests, and so we need to defy them. That is a perspective that one hears across the political spectrum, all the way from the far left through to the far right. That's the dilemma many French voters are facing. Back the candidate who's the choice of the establishment, of media owners and outlets they don't trust, or the clear anti-establishment candidate whose policies they can't stomach. This French election may well come down to what people vote against, as opposed to what or who they vote for. On the download now, our viewers on the political story in France and the coverage of Marine Le Pen. Because Marine Le Pen, according to the media, is promoting an anti-democratic program, everybody should join their forces in opposing her. And those who don't agree with it are very quickly and harshly condemned. Just this morning, there was a podcaster called Pierre-Emmanuel Barré, who wanted to do a pro-abstention podcast on France Inter. He had to quit his job and publish it on Facebook instead. I think uh, Marine Le Pen managed to de-demonize her party, the Front National, by making a split uh, with her father, Jean-Marie Le Pen. She's also making sure the media film her uh, in contact with the people.
uh, talking with them uh, on the markets, on marketplaces and uh, in factories for instance or just on the streets. Other media stories that are on our radar this week. The constitutional referendum in Turkey has come and gone, but these are still perilous times for some journalists there. Since the vote took place April 16th, dozens of Turks have been arrested for protesting over the legitimacy of the voting process. At least three journalists are among them, including the news editor of the leftist website Sendika, which reported on the protests. Police also raided Sendika's newsroom. The New York-based Committee to Protect Journalists said if Turkish authorities want citizens to accept the referendum results, they must allow critical voices to speak freely without fear of retaliation. In a separate development, prosecutors in Istanbul have arrested another six journalists under Article 301 of the Turkish Penal Code, which prohibits insults to Turkish identity. The arrests relate to reporting on the Turkish military in the Kurdish southeast. Most of those arrested were affiliated with DHA, a Kurdish news agency, which was among the more than 170 news outlets the government has shut down since last year's coup attempt. Back in 2015, we reported on the difficulties Nigerian journalists have had trying to cover the Boko Haram extremist group, including restrictions imposed by the government in Abuja. Now journalists in Cameroon, Nigeria's neighbor to the south, are encountering similar problems. A correspondent for Radio France International there, Ahmed Abba, has been sentenced to 10 years in prison for allegedly failing to denounce acts of terrorism. He's also been fined more than 80,000 euros. Prosecutors say Abba collaborated with Boko Haram and failed to pass on information about planned attacks. The journalist spent two years behind bars waiting for the conviction. At one stage, he faced the prospect of being executed for his so-called crimes. According to Amnesty International, Ahmed Abba's conviction after torture and an unfair trial is clear evidence that Cameroon's military courts are not competent to try civilians and should not have jurisdiction in these cases. Governments and their media regulators around the world have been known to hit media outlets with fines for alleged crimes against journalism over some of the stories they publish. Ecuador has come up with a novel twist on that, fining media outlets for failing to report on something. The story in question was about the recently defeated opposition candidate for president, Guillermo Lasso. An Argentinian newspaper, Pagina Doce, published a report accusing Lasso of financial irregularities and evading taxes through offshore holdings. When the Ecuadorian media failed to follow up, the country's media regulator, Supercom, fined numerous outlets close to $4,000 each. Those fined were newspapers El Comercio, El Universo, La Hora, and Expresso, as well as television broadcasters Tele Amazonas, Equavisa, and Televicentro. A lawyer for El Universo called the decision absurd and argued that the original Argentinian report could not be substantiated. The Inter-American Press Association said Ecuador has created a weapon of censorship, the worst in Latin America, to systematically violate freedom of the press. Over the past few months, we've looked at populist right-wing political movements on the rise, like the Front National in France, and the kind of news coverage they've attracted. This week, we'll swing our lens toward the political left and an upstart party in Spain that has issues with the mainstream media there. Podemos is Spanish for we can. The party is barely three years old. It's already Spain's third largest. Its leader, Pablo Iglesias, does not look like your typical Spanish politician. And Podemos's anti-austerity, anti-establishment platform was always destined to get a hostile reception from mainstream media outlets, most of which lean to the right. What Podemos did not see coming, however, was the treatment that it gets from El País, a center-left paper that is the most widely circulated in Spain. Overall, the media coverage of the party has concentrated on stories of corruption, the kind of political company Podemos keeps. The party has even been accused of plotting to destroy Spanish democracy. Iglesias says the mainstream news media's coverage is rooted in fear that Podemos's politics represent a threat to an economic system controlled by big business, a system the mainstream media are very much a part of. The Listening Post's Marcelo Pizarro now from Madrid on Podemos, its communication strategy and what it's up against in the Spanish media. It's 
not unusual for media figures to slip into politics and vice versa. But Paulo Iglesias hasn't left one career for the other. The Spanish academic is both a media player and the leader of Spain's newest left-wing political party, Podemos. In 2010, just as Spaniards took to the streets to protest austerity, Iglesias started presenting an online talk show called La Tuerca. The broadcast would lay the foundations for the political party and also injected Iglesias onto the talk show sets and the airwaves of the mainstream media. Hay más deuda, hay más paro y hay más desigualdad. Seven years later, Iglesias spends more time in Parliament than in the studio as the leader of the third largest political party in Spain. I think that La Tuerca was born as a marginal proposition, lacking resources, ready to die in its battle against the big networks. But beyond the success it may have had, it has shown that there was a crack in the wall, and we got in through this crack and have widened the space for ourselves. La Tuerca laid the foundations and proved the need for Podemos in Spanish politics. Although it may seem strange having a show like La Tuerca, it does explain the success of Pablo Iglesias, his shoot to stardom. Iglesias and his team did the legwork to understand how the media works, especially television, before their big jump into politics. Pablo has done something that I like to illustrate with this thought. If the revolutionaries of the past went up the mountains to fight, now they fight from TV studios. From 2014 onwards, Podemos made a series of electoral breakthroughs and the tone of media coverage switched from curiosity to alarm. The party was described as undemocratic, with economically unsound policies posing a threat to Spanish unity. And Podemos was reported to be connected to governments the Spanish media disapprove of. In April last year, the national paper ABC reported that the late Venezuelan president, Hugo Chavez, funded Podemos to the tune of 7 million euros. ABC's source document was real, but its interpretation was a reach. The funds had been sent to a left-wing think tank in 2008, six years before Podemos was even created. The editor of ABC stands by the story. We are among the very few who have consistently warned about the lack of democratic principles in Podemos. We stand up for freedom. Podemos doesn't. We stand for a free market economy. Podemos doesn't. We stand for the unity of Spain. Podemos doesn't. So it makes sense that we clash on these issues. We have a document that proves the Chavista regime gave Podemos over seven million dollars. Deciding whether the funding is irregular or not is a question for the courts. It's absurd for Podemos to pretend that the money from Venezuela is non-existent. ABC wasn't the only outlet to report on Podemos in Venezuela. No es nueva la relación que algunos partidos políticos españoles han tenido y tienen con el gobierno venezolano de Nicolás Maduro. In January 2016, Spain's largest private broadcaster, Antena 3, used old footage of academics linked to Podemos on a visit to Venezuela to say the party was in cahoots with the government in Caracas. Other outlets went even further. Eduardo Inda, the editor of online outlet OK Diario, accused Podemos of obtaining funds illegally from Venezuela, an allegation the party is still fighting in the courts. Many members of Podemos have been to court at least 10 or 12 times to face charges, some plainly absurd, others based on false evidence. We have won 100% of the cases. The charges have all been lies. However, the lack of truth doesn't seem to matter, because when they criticize you, it's in the headlines and the talk shows. When the judges say there is no case against you, nobody reports it. Few in Podemos have been surprised by the hostile coverage from commentators and outlets on the political right. But El País, Spain's centre-left newspaper of record, is another matter. In the pages of El País, Podemos has been presented as radical, its policies dangerous, and another emerging party, the right-wing Ciudadanos, has often been characterised as a new hope 
for Spain's tired and corrupt political system. We've been critical with Podemos for their stances and at the beginning with, for their financing. But we've been very critical with Ciudadanos. We actually don't give them like a lot of coverage. We haven't favored any type of coverage or we haven't favored any of their measures over the rest. El país has become more and more hostile towards what it considers to be threats to the status quo, namely Podemos and the Catalan independence movement. It has been much kinder towards Ciudadanos, and this happened when Podemos started to emerge as a political alternative that could really change the balance of forces within the political establishment. There's another factor at play in Spain's press, their economic crisis. With falling revenues, advertiser shortfalls and fewer readers, newspapers like El País, El Mundo and La Vanguardia have had to turn to some of the country's largest banks, like Caixa Bank and Banco Santander, for loans to bail them out. The new economic reality has had an impact on newsrooms through layoffs, and some say editorial output has been affected too. The Spanish media are now weapons of massive disinformation. Papers of record in Spain, like El País, are merely vehicles of special interests, sometimes at war with each other. We know that 100% of Spanish press are losing money, and the outlets are kept afloat by big economic players, because it's a way to put pressure on the political establishment. This newspaper doesn't have, at the editorial level, any contact with any financial institutions, or any of the investors that have a stake in the Prisa Group, which is the parent company. There is no such thing as any collusion between the editorial part and the financial interest. While its dust-ups with Spanish media continue, Podemos has kept chipping away at what it calls the status quo narrative. The party still churns out the weekly broadcast that got it started. Some have described the media output here at La Tuerca as partisan, populist, as propaganda. Podemos say it's just the way round the political and economic orthodoxies that dominate media coverage in Spain. I would say the political leaders of Podemos have been very, very effective in controlling the message and the way they deliver the message. No les damos miedo nosotros, les da miedo lo que representamos. Y para ellos representamos la libertad. And I think they have actually valued more form over substance. In a way in which they have actually gotten a lot of coverage, image coverage, TV coverage, newspaper coverage. We know Podemos benefits from being the protagonists in the media. But I can proudly say that ABC doesn't play along very often. The strategy of Podemos is sometimes childish or even narcissistic. It's like they're playing rather than doing politics. That hostile attitude towards Podemos should be taken as a positive sign, since this hostile treatment comes from them being regarded as a threat. Podemos has two possibilities ahead. Either they're forgotten by the media because they pose no threat, or the media ends up repositioning itself because Podemos managed to truly condition Spanish politics. Finally, Donald Trump arrived at the White House promising to deliver jobs to Americans. And he has. Fact checkers have never had it so good. They've been pouring through Trump's speeches and tweets for misleading statements, falsehoods, the euphemisms that journalists feel compelled to use whenever a powerful politician is lying to them. Trump's interview with the Associated Press last week is a case in point. It had the Washington Post's fact-checking team working overtime, identifying no fewer than 14 false or misleading claims, and that's just one interview. We leave you now with some of the Post's selection of deception from America's post-fact president, and we'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. Mm -hmm.